I call the meeting of the Joint House Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee and the Senate Climate, Environment and Legacy Committee to order. Uh, this is the second joint uh, committee hearing uh, we have had this year. Just a little bit on process. Uh, we actually have to adopt the minutes for the last joint meeting because we can't adopt those minutes when we're meeting separately. So, uh, but we do not have a quorum for that. So when we actually achieve a quorum, uh, we will adopt the minutes. We have a number of testifiers today. Uh, we are going to be first hearing from the University of Minnesota. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources, uh, Commissioner Stroman, will be walking over from the Capitol. We may uh, uh, either fit in Chair Dupuis from Fond du Lac before Commissioner Stroman or after, kind of depending on the, time, uh, the timeline. Um, we will provide the opportunity for questions after each block of testifiers. So after uh, Dr. Larson and Dr. Osterholm, we'll make uh, some time for questions. And we do have to be done at 4.30. So, Senator Hur, any comments that you have? Or? Oh, uh, just like that. This good, is this good opportunity of a joint uh, committee one more time. And want to welcome my Senate members to the House. Uh, <laughs> we decide where, where to take, where meetings should be carried. And looks like this little Although the, this, the space is not as the size of the uh, Senate committee, but the seating, that's what matters. The seating, um, is, there's more seating here in the House, so that's why we decide to have our joint committee here. But welcome to our council and our uh, senators um, that are here in, in the joint committee. And look forward to the testimony. Thank you. Uh, first up, we have uh, Dr. Peter Larson for the Minnesota Center for Prion Research and Outreach, and uh, Dr. Michael Osterholm, Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. Dr. Larson, are you going first? Yes. Chairs Hansen and her representative senators, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Dr. Peter Larson. I am co-director of the Minnesota Center for Prion Research and Outreach. I'm also assistant professor in the Department of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences at the College of, Minnesota, of, College of Veterinary Medicine, University of Minnesota. I'm here today to talk about, um, to share some of the educational, uh, it's CWD 101. So I'm gonna talk about CWD basics, some basic biology, so that we can all understand this disease together. Um, but first a highlight of MinPro, our, our research and outreach center at the U of M. MinPro organized in 2019 after um, funding uh, from the state, from the LCCMR, um, and we were tasked with developing new diagnostic tools for chronic wasting disease. I'm gonna highlight some of those tools at the end of my talk today. Um, but we have grown uh, so much in the last uh, four years. Um, we are launching innovative outreach campaigns. We estimated that we have reached over 30,000 Minnesotans uh, through direct one-on-one uh, -on -one presentations over the last four years, as well as webinars. This is the leadership of the center. I could not do what I do without a, a fantastic team. So Dr. Tiffany Wolf is co-director of MinPro. Dr. Seng Hyun Oh is here with us today. He's director of engineering. And Mark Schwabenlander is associate director. Um, there are 40 research affiliates across multiple uh, universities, state agencies, and tribal agencies that we are collaborating with. We are now going international. We have collaborators in Canada as well as Norway. And the center is growing with respect to undergraduate, graduate students, even high schoolers are coming in to do rotations uh, within our laboratory. So it's, it's a really exciting time. We are growing quite rapidly. I want to highlight quickly Dr. Stuart Lichtenberg, who is a research scientist and joined us in January. Um, he, we were able to recruit Stuart from the University of Wisconsin. He specializes in soil biology and understanding prions, CW prions in soil. And this is a strategic initiative that was supported by the ENT, ENTRF and uh, LCCMR. So I want to highlight, highlight that. The MinPro team and Stuart, we're currently having a, a soil meeting funded by the LCCMR today. It was just by chance that these meetings overlapped. And so the rest of the leadership is there working on this problem actively of identifying CW prions in soil outline of today's presentation, I'm going to talk about what is a prion. So we have this, we, you hear frequently um, a prion, uh, CWD prions, what is that? What does that mean? And so I'm going to go through the, the basic biology of what that is so we can understand and visualize what a prion actually is. And then a little bit about CWD 101, some, just some basic facts about the disease so that, um, that will help uh, generate questions and help us understand talks from the following presenters. I'll dig in a little bit to the risk for of risk to humans, and then we'll hear more about that from Professor Osterholm. What is a prion? So when I give this lecture, um, 
various audiences. I ask everyone in the room, raise your hand if you've heard about a prion. Keep your hand up if you really feel confident and understand what a prion is, and everyone shoots their hand down really fast because it's, it's enigmatic, it's mysterious. On the right is a ribbon diagram. It's a three-dimensional structure. This is the way that scientists can help view uh, proteins. That's what a normal prion protein looks like. Everybody in this room here today, we all have normal functioning prion proteins. They play a role in normal cellular function. Um, they help regulate copper, zinc, metals. Uh, they're enriched in the nervous system. They have a, a role in mitochondrial function. Um, they are, uh, in, as I said, enriched in the nervous tissues. And so when we're thinking about prion diseases, prion diseases like CWD and neurological impacts, it's because that normal prion is enriched in nerves. One way to visualize prions, and you have to think three-dimensionally when thinking about prions and thinking about CWD prions, is to view it as a slinky. So this model, this slinky, this has a particular function. If I was to go and put this down the stairs, the slinky would go down the stairs and walk down the stairs. This is a normal, functioning, healthy prion protein. On the right, that's a ribbon diagram of, it's called beta sheets. Scientists call this structure beta sheets. So it's all stacked together. That can be visualized as a misfolded prion protein, infectious form. So this slinky, it's all misfolded. It's lost its structure. It can no longer go down the stairs and walk down the stairs like a normal slinky. If I were to put that down, it would just roll down, lost its structure. But this is the infectious form, okay? So you have the normal form and the infectious form. What happens with prion diseases, including CWD, is if this misfolded form, this misfolded slinky, comes into contact with the normal form, it will cause this to misfold. It comes into contact, it interacts with it, again, thinking three-dimensionally, and it will cause it to unwind, relax, and then reform into a beta sheet, a misfolded structure. That's how a normal prion can become infectious. I view this process as a chaos engine of prion diseases because you have this domino effect. So let's say I'm a deer and I've ingested this and now it starts spreading through my nervous system and it's colonizing my brain. It's a process that can take two years and it slowly spreads through that animal in the end stage phenotype on the right there in deer, that's CWD, in uh, sheep, that's scrapie, and in cow and cattle, that's BSE. In humans, if this were to happen, that would be a variant or crutzfeld jakob disease. We be crutzfeld jakob disease. So we know a lot about chronic wasting disease from understanding these other prion diseases across animals and humans. As I said, it can take about two years before you witness uh, clinical symptoms. The reason why that is, is when this is in the deer, when it's spreading through the deer, there's not a massive immune response that's mounted. And so that's why when a hunter says, well, you know, I, 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 here's my harvest, but it's testing CBD positive, it looked completely healthy. Um, it's because there was no immune response. This is moving slowly through the animal and slowly colonizing the brain. It's not to the end of that two years where it starts killing neurons, where you start to see weight loss, increased drinking, excessive drooling. That's because you're killing the brain and the animal, or the disease, chronic wasting disease, got its name because the animal literally wastes away. Uh, we do, uh, this spreads through direct and indirect contact. So direct deer or social animals, they come together, they can spread it through bodily fluids, but also the environment. This molecule can remain infectious in the, in the environment for years, perhaps decades. One um, aspect of CWD and other prion diseases is when you think about diagnostic testing and the tissues that are needed for diagnostic testing, there's um, a focus on lymph nodes. So many of you that are, are deer hunters or cervid farmers out there know that you have to submit lymph nodes for testing to the DNR, to the USDA, to understand whether or not you know, an animal has CWD. The reason why that is, on the left, I'm, looking, I'm showing a, a diagram of uh, the lymph system in green there, and there are lymph nodes throughout this particular deer. Here is the retrofragile lymph node, or at the neck, neck of that deer, that is what the, we have to extract to um, use for CBD testing because the CBD prions enrich into those lymph nodes over time. There is a model of a deer head sitting in front of Chair Hansen there. There are retropharyngeal lymph nodes. This is a full scale 3D printed white tailed deer head that we uh, printed at the University of Minnesota. And you can see the retropharyngeal lymph nodes in there, those two white nodes. Um, that is what folks need to dig in and pull out for testing. It's a, it can be difficult. On the right is a, nerv a nervous system of uh, a, a deer, a white tailed deer. 
these prions, over time, they start spreading along these nerves, and it's like a super highway to the brain, and that's how they end up colonizing the brain and begin killing neurons. Environmental contamination with CBD is a big, big problem. So infected deer can spread these molecules into the environment through their feces, through bodily fluids, through carcasses. This can remain infectious in the environment for years. We have data now that we're generating um, uh, through staff at MIMPRO where we believe that these can be detected 15 years um, after a particular uh, herd has been depopulated. Um, there's data showing that these can actually be incorporated into the roots of plants, brought out into the plant's leaves, incorporated in leaves, and then in laboratory tests, they've confirmed that uh, plants can pass on infectious prions to mice that are fed the leaves. They actually contract a prion disease and die. So that paper came out um, probably about eight to 10 years ago. Um, and these are detectable in water. There's a paper out of Colorado that shows that um, these prions can be uh, detected in snow melt from positive herds, um, they, they can congregate and then move in waterways. And so that's part of the research that we're doing at MinPro is understanding how they spread through Minnesota's waterways. A really um, important issue here uh, when thinking about how these remain in the environment, if you see, a, uh, if you consider a CDB positive herd on the left, um, those two buck there are representing a positive herd um, where there's low prion output. On the right, if you have a lot of animals that are positive and congregated in a central spot, the prion output is quite high because um, they can, because they're excreting these in their feces, in their urine, in carcasses, over time, that can accumulate in the environment. And you can think about, I, the way that I, I consider this, it's almost like radioactive material is being put in the environment. It can stay there for years. And where does that go? How does, it, how does water and how do scavengers, et cetera, move that around the environment? Um, and again, we have uh, soil data now from a uh, location in the upper Midwest where um, uh, 15 years after a depopulation event, we're identifying prions in the soil. Really quick about the genetics of CWD. Um, there's uh, a lot of interest in here, uh, in this uh, topic right now. Um, the genetic background of deer, the DNA of a particular individual, that does influence susceptibility to CWD. Some individuals are more susceptible. Some individuals are less susceptible. Resistance is a wrong term. It's all about susceptibility. There is no such thing as immune and immune as a, as a deer that's immune to CWD. If you, are a resist, if you are a susceptible phenotype, if this comes in and you have a susceptible genetic background, it'll spread to you very fast. If you have a, if you're not susceptible, right, if you're less susceptible, if it comes in, it will spread to you very slow. Um, but CWD is always 100% fatal. So. When thinking about breeding, um, our position is that we have to confirm that CWD prions are, now, are not being output by a, a given herd. That requires active surveillance, live animal testing, and even herd level surveillance. We can identify the CWD prions in muscle. This is a paper that the MinPro team published a couple years ago. Um, we can use our ultra-sensitive diagnostic test to identify uh, these prions in a variety of muscle tissues. I'm showing you um, from this diagram on the right, just various muscle groups that we uh, tested. There's a, st a study out of Canada um, that suggests that monkeys uh, fed CBD positive venison actually contracted a prion disease. Um, that study is still in progress. But because of these observations, the CDC recommends not consuming CBD positive venison. The big question is, can humans get CWD? There's no confirmed cases of CWD in humans. However, there's evidence that um, it can be transmitted to other species, pigs, rodents, monkeys. There's growing concern of human transmission. Why is that? To understand that, you have to think three-dimensionally and think about this slinky. There's such a thing as CWD strain variation. Just like you have different strains of, strains of viruses, you can have different strains of prions, but in a prion, it's the shape. So if you have subtle shapes like this, that's different prion strains. It could be that there is a normal human prion protein. Let's say I have this normal human prion protein in my genetic background. And let's say there is a particular population of white-tailed deer, of mule deer, somewhere in the US that have a particular shape 
that fits with mine, that is why we're concerned because that could actually cause a domino effect and cause a neurogenic disease within me. So difficult to confirm, but this is a growing concern in the scientific community. Uh, and we can look to Scrapey and BSE to understand more about this. On the left is Scrapey, no known cases since the uh, 1700s, um, as long as we've known about Scrapey. On the right, BSE, mad cow, over 230 people um, have died of a variant, uh, kretzel yakov disease of consuming BSE positive um, uh, um, materials, uh, meat. So we have to reduce the consumption of CWD positive venison throughout the U.S. I believe now the numbers are in uh, the range of 20 to maybe 25,000 uh, positive carcasses or positive deer are consumed annually in the U.S. and that number is going to grow as the disease spreads throughout the U.S. Bottom line is this is the enemy, this is what we're fighting, how do we fight it effectively? And this is why the work that the DNR, the Board of Mental Health, USDA, is the work that they're doing is so important. So we have to manage this. We have to prevent it from spreading. That involves targeted culling, advanced surveillance methods, and hunting. Hunting is so important. If we do not keep hunting up, uh, the disease can spread quicker. So we have to maintain hunting pressure throughout the state. And also strategic funding. So our team was funded um, uh, to produce new diagnostic tools, um, but we're also outreach and education is super important uh, way to fight this disease. Finishing up, just a couple of highlights. This is a collaboration with the, um, our team, the DNR, the Board of Animal Health. Um, many of you are aware of the uh, illegal carcass dump site up in Beltrami County. We used a prion forensics approach where we were actually able to go out in nature, collect remains across the, um, the dump site, and it's showing you in panel B here. Um, the red dots are remains where we identified um, what we believe to be six positive white-tailed deer that were strewn about by scavengers. And we were able to use our approaches um, in the lab to confirm that uh, some of those um, uh, carcasses were positive CWD. We then used a DNA forensics approach where we were able to confirm that remains in the dump site were genetic matched to the herd that was depopulated. Um, and uh, right now, this is, um, I'm circling, highlighting just a couple days ago from SIDRAP. The U.S. is experiencing a nationwide shortage of diagnostic kits. This is a big problem. So diagnostics is, is routinely, every hunting season, we hear people waiting six to eight weeks for results. So there's major limitations there. Our lab is using an advanced diagnostic test called RT-QUIC. Um, it's ultra sensitive and there's diagnostic labs around the world that are using this method now. Um, it's not just ours, there's labs throughout the U.S., throughout uh, um, Canada, Norway, um, and it's being used for, for not just CWD, but also to understand Parkinson's and ALS. So there's a lot of um, robust data on RT-QUIC out there. We're supporting a national network of RT-QUIC labs. Um, you can see the geographic areas there that we're, we are supporting um, their RT-QUIC research as well. In 2019, I sat in the same chair and I promised the state of Minnesota, I promised you all that our team would help and do whatever we can to develop new diagnostic tools to detect um, CWD prions in a more effective manner. And I'm here to tell you that we've accomplished this. We do have some fantastic diagnostics available in ProLab now. There's one that we've named after the state of Minnesota called Minnesota Quick. You can see the color diagram on the right there, red for positive and purple or blue for negative. So the question is, how does the state want to use these tools? Um, we can perform live animal testing. That was a big deal back in 2018 and 2019. We can do that using a skin biopsy with 95 to 100% accuracy. There's also environmental surveillance options. We have sentinels that we can put into herds in the farm setting or in the wildlife and swab those sentinels to see if CBD prions are being deposited. We also have a prototype of a four hour test. And in order to get these things out into the public, we are launching or have launched a startup company called Preaging Corporation. Um, our goal is to fight CWD, uh, protect that rich tradition of deer and elk country and across the US, um, and revolutionize pre and diagnostics and services. Um, we have the technology and our goal is to get this, these technologies commercialized over the coming months and years. Uh, we have launched muscle testing. So this is available now on our, through our uh, Preagent website. We are selling muscle kits so that if individuals want to test muscle for CWD, they can do that now. This is the world's first muscle test. 
With that, I am open for any questions you might have. Thank you. We actually do have a quorum, so if we could get a motion to approve the minutes. Senator Kinesh, your hand. So, oh, so, so approved. Um, Representative, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm flustered being back in the House. I thought I had to push the button. <laughs> Senator Kanesh moves approval of the joint minutes from January 10th. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion prevails. The minutes are approved. Dr. Her, if you want to, well, why don't we go to uh, Dr. Osterholm? And then we'll do questions for both. I know Dr. Ostrom has another appointment. So welcome and state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's a great honor. It's, uh, it was a striking moment for me today as I walked into this building. I realized that 45 years ago, I testified for the first time in this building. And I've been testifying for the last 45 years. And it never gets old and it never is not important. So thank you for all. And for some of you who were not born at the time I first testified, uh, it, hopefully it. Uh, Hasn't been too long. So, well, today I'm here to talk about chronic waste disease and urgent need for critical preparedness. Um, you know, my job as an epidemiologist is to not just talk about what's happening today, but try to predict the future and where we're going and what we're talking about. And I hope to do that today in sharing this with you. I had the experience back in the 1980s where I was involved with the early assessment of BOC in the United Kingdom at a time when people all assumed that nothing bad would come from it. And I'll never forget. The, uh, base, the agriculture minister taking his grandchildren out for a hamburger and eating it on film and showing everyone how safe it was. Of course, we knew later. Well, we can't tell you with perfect vision today what will happen or where it's, what is likely the outcomes of CWD, but there's some trends that are very concerning, and I plan to share those with you today. As you can see, CWD and the servants continue to expand geographically, as we've already been talking about. In 2000, just think about that, 23 years ago, this was only in five states and one province. By 2010, it had gone to 17 states and two provinces, and now, as you know, it's up to 30 states and four provinces. It continues to move, continues to expand where it's at. If you look at issues of the prevalence increasing, in some parts of core, for example, CWD areas in southwestern Wisconsin, 30% of the adult does and 40 to 50% of adult bucks are positive even higher in Wyoming. And we're seeing that continue wherever it gets introduced. It just is a matter of marching forward in terms of the numbers of growing increasingly large. Remember, these are deer that are largely hunted as in Wisconsin and often not tested. We know that animal and human exposure to CWD prions is increasing as the number itself increases. Uh, the estimates about how many animals get tested in given locations surely uh, is a challenge, often in nothing more than single digits or slightly low double digit figures. So all the rest are basically being consumed. Uh, it's important to recognize that if you look at just the US population white-tailed deer, it's over 30 million animals estimated. It includes a million right here in Minnesota. And as, a deer, as this disease spreads, it's important to think about the hunters and family who rely on and constantly consume venison as a very important part of their fundamental diet. Agriculture production animals that might have an overlapping range, I'll talk more about that in terms of the risk that this disease poses to other animals besides servants. And then finally, even other wildlife and what that means. Now, one of the challenges we have, and Dr. Larson in his outstanding presentation just shared that, is the fact that the transmission from service to other species is increasing as we see more new strains of the prion evolve. We now have 10 strains that we've identified and even some of the early work that was done uh, demonstrating that strains didn't likely transmit or that they were quote-unquote resistant didn't take into account the emerging strains and different strains. I'll give you a case in point. When the uh, virus first emerged out of Wuhan, COVID, an average person transmitted to two people. That was the, what we call the r naught. By the time we hit Omicron this past spring, the average person transmitted to 16 people. And each successive change in the strains made it more and more and more infectious. So to talk about COVID in Omicron days versus what happened in Wuhan is the difference between night and day. We're seeing that very same thing happen with prions and what's happening right now with CWD. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is. And we do now have documented transmission here 
uh, basically uh, in terms of, of other animal species, but should this happen to human or production animals, this will be a crisis second to none. You know, for the last 48 years, I've lived in this state trying to deal with crisis, and I can't imagine one that would be more chilling than all the Minnesota families who've been consuming deer and what that means. So, go ahead. If we look at the... We'll do the questions after they're done. Well, it, for, well, it's right. after the end of the presentation, um, oh, and we've got a list, so Dr. Ostrom. Okay, continue. if we look at the implications, obviously, for public health, agriculture, trade, wildlife, and conservation, it's huge. Today, wildlife conservation is largely supported uh, based on deer hunting licenses throughout the country. Should that be reduced, that'll be a challenge. As Dr. Larson just said, should we see a reduction in deer harvest each year? That will only spread the disease much more quickly. What we've focused on has been trying to control CWD or limit it from a wildlife standpoint, which is a very important and legitimate term issue. But we have no state, federal, or international agency right now is preparing for the potential crisis of CWD prion transmission to a human or production animals. What would we do today if we actually had our first human case? And I can tell you at CIDRAP, we have assembled 59 of the world's leading experts in CWD who have a handout demonstrating who those people are. And there is general agreement across the board that with the strain changes, we are moving closer and closer to the potential, to the potential for a human transmitted prion infection to actually occur. And if there's one, there will be more. What would that do to hunting? What would that do to the medical care system? As you've already heard from Dr. Larson, we don't have enough testing right now to handle deer testing. The only location in the entire United States that can actually test for and confirm a prion disease in humans is the Case Western Reserve University Hospitals in Cleveland. And they are already backed up with what they have now. And if we were to have suddenly a situation where many clinicians needed to determine, does this person have CWD, the system would collapse overnight. Public health has no preparedness. Ag has no preparedness. So one of the things we're talking about is continuing to emphasize what Dr. Larson has just well described, but also we need to prepare. Even if it never happens, we have to have the book on the shelf that says what will we do. So this emergency issue is really all about hoping it never happens, but hope is not a strategy. What are the threats? We've already talked about the increasing frequency of exposure to CWD prions among cervids, humans, and other animal species. Clearly, it's not just the volume of the number of animals that are infected, but also as we keep seeing these new strains. And as I pointed out before, the propagation now of at least 10 novel CWD strains, each would have distinct host ranges, which means that that by itself is what's gonna drive the potential for transmission to other animal species or to humans that might not have existed five to 10 or 15 years ago. That's a huge issue. We first came to you back in 2019 at the same hearing that uh, Professor Larson talked about, in which we raised this issue and said that we were very concerned about it and that we had to address it. Well, since that time, this paper just published in the last uh, several months from the group in Alberta is really one of the definitive papers really looking at what's happening with the emergency CWD strains, confirming all that we've been concerned about. As you see here, the strains can affect biochemical neuropathological properties of the infectious agent, and importantly, interspecies transmission, and, and basically demonstrating what, what Professor Larson did with the slinkies and how this was constantly changing. One aspect of the paper, many studies used uh, to assess CWD and its properties lack strain-specific data. We can't use those studies in many cases from five to seven years ago because it wasn't the most current strains. Just like if I talked to you about COVID control, from 2020 in January versus today, it'd be totally different events. And so what we're co confronting here is the fact that this is a changing risk situation. And in the early CWD studies, it was common for pooled isolates to be used, that we never looked at what happens if this one takes off, if this particular one that has much more uh, po possibilities of actually infecting a human. Also, they said in this paper, because different CWD strains can have unique host ranges and the overall lack of strain-specific data, complicates the understanding of transmission potential. I wish I could tell you exactly, this is the strain that will do it, this one won't. We're dealing with this issue right now with H5N1 influenza. Is there a strain of that after 20 some years circulating that's gonna finally cross into humans? We can't tell you that, but everybody's concerned about it. Well, we have the same situation here where the species barrier effect surely is not 
necessarily at all impenetrable. As CWD spreads, novel strains are expected to emerge, which could reshape associated risk. Think about the number of animals that are infected now and how that continues to grow. Each one of those is an evolutionary laboratory all by themselves. Each time that gets to positive environment, it's another opportunity for another prion species to emerge and be consumed by another uh, cervid or any other animal species. So what are we worried about? Well, unlike the issue with BSE, as you just heard, this prion is actually in the skeletal muscle. It's not just in the central nervous system. So the potential to consume it with consuming venison is absolutely a totally different environment. We already have evidence of CWD transmission in animal models demonstrating human adaption and zoonotic potential. In humanized mice, where we've actually changed their immune system in the sense to be able to act more like a human, we're already seeing transmission of prions to humanized mice, something we haven't seen before. We now have evidence, actually, uh, that pigs may contract CWD with cases among feral swine living in CWD endemic regions of Arkansas. If we can go to a feral pig, I don't know what will keep it from a production animal pig. And so again, can you imagine what would happen to our agricultural situation if we weren't prepared for this and we weren't ready to understand how we're going to respond? What would we say? We already have challenges with embargoes right now of our hay for Norway because of the issue of the prion. So also here, if we look at trade restrictions, as I mentioned just now about the hay and straw, we know that CWD spread can significantly affect honey. One of the greatest challenges we would have to controlling this disease even further is if hunting suddenly dissipated and people said, I'm not going to do it. I, don't, I can't get the animal tested or I don't trust it. I don't want to do it. That would be absolutely the worst thing that could happen and continue to spread this. And clearly, it would really, really jeopardize wildlife uh, as, uh, management as we know it in this country. Finally, as we see there, statewide uh, wildlife agencies have identified CWD as the most important existential challenge confronting agencies in the 21st century. Paper here by Thompson Mason. Russ Mason is one of our experts on our, on our SIDRAP response effort. So let me just basically say, right now we're here to tell you that there is no cross-disciplinary playbook exists to adequately address the CWD-related crisis. Not in Minnesota, not in the United States, not in any agency. We need current comprehensive and authoritative information so that if something does happen, and pray to God it doesn't, but if it happens, what will we do? How will we react? What kind of testing will be available? How will we communicate to the public? Imagine you're the family that has been consuming deer for the last 25 years from an area where CWD is present. You've never tested your deer, and now somebody tells you, oh, by the way, this now can transmit to people. What will we tell that family? We have to prepare now. So to our, our effort we're coming forward to you with is to provide update, reputable materials to stakeholders, bringing together our expert advisory groups of all these different areas which you have the listing there to actually develop working groups of hum for human veterinary medicine and public health, human servant and production animal testing and surveillance, one in agricultural and trade, one on disposal issues, and one on wildlife and conservation. And, and basically come back with a playbook that says this is what the consensus will be, whether it's the CDC, whether it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture, whether it's the NIH, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? So I leave you with this hope that we never, ever, ever see human transmitted CWD to, to a human. But as I said a moment ago, hope is not a strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Osterholm. Uh, we're going to go to question now. Um, and we're going to set a little guideline. Um, we're open for one follow-up, if there's a question, um, just to keep out time, just to keep us in time uh, with this uh, joint committee. So the first person to uh, hear on the list for question is Dr. Wis um, Senator Wissenberg. Knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President, or not President. Um, Senator. S Senator, yes. Mr. Um, Mr. Chair, there we go. Um, I just have a question. I guess I heard uh, it sounded like we were comparing CWD to COVID. Um, if that is the case, I would like to see the data of um, CWD and COVID being linked. Now, if obviously COVID was bad and scary, but we can't be just saying that that's going to happen if it's not true. So uh, do you have that data? And if you do have that data, I would like to see it. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Senator. 
Officer I'm not quite sure what you mean by data, but let me give you my interpretation. What I talked about was how the virus changed over time. Oh. And we do have those data very clearly. We saw a virus that was not nearly as infectious as it ultimately became. And it did that through passing through more and more people. What we're seeing is the same thing with the CWD prion as it passes through more and more um, cervids. And that's what I was talking about with the strain issues. And that's exactly what Dr. Larson was talking about, is that with strains, that's the big concern that we have. So the analogy is not that COVID is CWD or CWD is COVID, but from an evolutionary standpoint, the viruses and prions are doing exactly the same thing. They're changing, they're evolving as they pass through more and more hosts. Senator I, I, thank you, thank you, Chair. I would like to follow up with that. Um, in science, we can't be using analogies that aren't directly um, aligned. So we can't be saying CWD is like COVID as a scare tactic. That's, um, that's not okay. We can't be doing that. Um, I just, I don't, I don't like that language. So compare CWD to CWD, but don't say it's like COVID. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Um, point well taken. Uh, let's see, next to, next is uh, Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to say thank you to Dr. Larson and Ulsterholm for, for the continued work you folks have been doing in this area. Uh, the question I have is, uh, I'm concerned about how long the lag time is for detection in deer. You know, it could be up to two years from what I'm hearing. If that were to cross over, how would we be able to detect that in the human population? Would it be something that might present quickly, or is it something that it would be up to two years after the fact? And I know this is a little speculation here. And on top of that, what kind of methods would be used out, uh, exist out there that would try to highlight if this were to cross over? Uh, is there coordination with the Department of Health? Uh, chairs, uh, represent. Yep. Uh, Chairs, um, Representative, thank you for that question. Um, first, the lag time for detecting CWD, you can actually detect CWD prions in a positive animal maybe six months after an, an infection um, using traditional methods, using more advanced methods. It can be months, like weeks. Um, and so uh, we, can, we can accurately detect uh, presence before that two-year timeline. That two-year timeline is how long it takes for that disease to show external phenotypes. The question is, uh, how would we know um, if this were to emerge into humans and what would that look like? What would the testing look like? If it were to emerge as a, as a, a variant crutzfeld jakob disease, if that's the, the prion equivalent, uh, prion disease equivalent in humans, um, we could use the prion diagnostic tests that we currently have access to. This RT quick test is currently being used uh, to detect variant crutzfeld jakob disease. Um, it's very accurate. Uh, but it is an excellent question because we don't understand what that spectrum of neurogenic disease might look like. How is CWD actually going to look like in the human population if it crosses over? I don't think we have a good understanding of, of that. And I'll, I'll pass it over to <coughs> Professor Ilstrom. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, a, a very important point. And one of the issues that we want to take up with our work groups is the fact that we don't have good diagnostic criteria right now for when we could say that somebody actually has CWD versus that they have creutzfeldt jakob disease, a disease we'd expect to see in 70 and 80 year olds. You know, we have about one per million every year in this state naturally occurring. Well, one of the challenges we have right now is, is that if somebody came in at 38 years of age with cognitive dysfunction consistent with some type of a Alzheimer's-like picture, that would be a key right there. That's what happened in the United Kingdom when we had BSE. But the problem was it took almost 10 years for that to unfold between the time that they got the spinal material out of the meat supply and those animals gone until you saw the big outbreak of BSE. So people ask me today, I could not answer this, are we sitting on top of a CWD human epidemic right now? We could be. I don't know. Or could it be 10, 20 years off, or maybe it'll never happen? That's the uncertainty we have, and that's what we've got to get more certainty around. How are we going to find that out? What are we going to do? We need to make sure if there are clusters of cases or individual cases that are outliers, no 38-year-old in this country should be diagnosed with Christoph Jakob disease, okay? That then tells you, okay, how does that person get filtered into the medical care system to quickly define that? And so... You, you are exactly right, and we do not have a plan for that right now. We need to. Uh, Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for the presentation. And so 
Uh, Dr. Larson, you mentioned that, you know, uh, the uh, CW could be, the prions could be infectious for many years. And I think this kind of ties to the issue about the disposal. So what happens if uh, a family, uh, you know, have a harvest, they bring back and use their materials to to process the, the venison and that uh, carcass and, you know, bones, whatnot, enters our waste system, what happens then? It's an excellent question. Dr. Larson. Chairs, Rep. Lee. Um, so the question is what happens if a, a family has, is processed a positive animal? Um, uh, first thing that would happen is the, the DNR would receive that positive and notify the family. Um, and the DNR will work to identify where that carcass is to help clean it up. Uh, regarding the, the materials that were used to process, um, we recommend a 40% bleach solution on stainless steel. The issue with CBD prions, other prions, is that um, if that gets into porous material like plastics or wood, carving board, um, you really cannot uh, decontaminate that. Um, they are very, very uh, robust and difficult to break down. Um, and so uh, really it comes down to following DNR recommendations for how to process the animal um, and uh, that waste stream, where that goes, this is a subject of intense debate right now. Um, and I'll probably uh, let the DNR answer that question as they are navigating that waste stream um, uh, annually. Mr. Chair, could I just add a piece to that? Our center is actually conducting a major project right now with one of our PhD students who's here with us today on carcass disposal practices throughout the United States and how that is being handled, which is a, a subset of what you were asking about any carcass at all. But I think one of the other things we have right now is a non-system. It is not well-defined. Uh, it's a local practice wherever. And again, imagine if we have a CWD case transmitted to a human and somebody says, wait a minute, are you putting my carcasses here or there or there? Could it get into my water system? What will happen? We better have answers. We better be prepared to deal with that issue and we're not right now. So it's a very important point. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Last follow-up. And so uh, just looking at you know, your presentation to you, you said that it's detectable in water now. Have you looked at or considered looking at waters from our treatment facilities? Are we seeing, you know, prions there? Or is that something that uh, you're concerning as you move into the future? Uh, uh, Dr. Larson? Chairs, uh, Rep. Lee, this is something that we are concerned about. There is one, one paper, one, out of Colorado where they detected CFD prions at the intake valve of a water treatment plant. Um, we do have funding focus, to focus on detection in water, so we are, have developed methods right now that we're using in our lab that can detect prions in water. There's a lot of complexities, though, because there's sediments and other things that bind to those prions, and so it's trying to figure out how to tease those out. Um, uh, right now, I, I don't believe that we have a good understanding of what that prion load is in the waterways of Minnesota, as long as that wild herd, as long as that, that the percentage stays down, like what it looks like in one to 2% in Southeast Minnesota, then that's promising. That means that, you know, if the prion output in the environment isn't quite high. If you get in a situation like in Colorado or in Wisconsin, where you have large positive herds, that, that becomes an environmental problem. Thank you. Uh, next here, um, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, doctors, for the presentation. You know, you've been ringing the alarm bells for years on this, and they're as loud as I've heard them today. This is a really sobering presentation. Um, I, I didn't realize the extent to the geographic spread, 30 states and four provinces, and the numbers from Wisconsin are, uh, wow, 30% <laughs> of doe, adult does and 40 to 50% of adult bucks. Um, you know, this is a disease that is 100% fatal in the animals that it infects. Uh, this is very frightening information that to ponder, um, as you pointed out, the, the chance of it infecting humans um, or production animals. I guess, you know, here, here you have the environment committees in the House and Senate before you. This is part of our jurisdiction. What legislation would you suggest? How can we help? What's our role here? 
Mr. Um, Chair? Um, yes, Senator. Well, first of all, uh, you have to have a plan of some kind. We, need, we don't need to go around the sky is falling, the sky is falling, although this is a serious situation. And so what we're proposing is we need to lay out a game plan and to say, what will this take? What will this take? What will this take? What will this take to do it? And have it be reasoned and rational. And so, for example, on the testing issues, how, how, as a physician, you know so well, what would happen if somebody called you up from your practice and said, my husband's a deer hunter and he's starting to act strange right now. Does he have that deer disease? Well, somebody's got to have answers. Somebody's got to have a way to do that. And so what we're trying to do is set up in a comprehensive way. Um, production animals, you know, I have a great fear. What happens if our bovine or porcine animal populations are suddenly basically trade restrictions for the world because we have one or two animals positive. So we don't have a plan. So I think right now, give us the time, which we know it's urgent, and we'll go back, we'll go do that and come back to you with, this is the plan. Is it gonna cost something else to do this? How will we do it? How do we get all the parties involved? You know, wildlife, uh, production animals, human medicine, public health. I can tell you, as I said earlier, the capability of Case Western Reserve University to handle even a slight bump in activity is zip zero. You know, we've been there before with other crises. We need to say that. Now, that's not Minnesota's job to do that. That's the federal government's. But we need to identify that, right? And I think that's a huge issue. Well, uh, Dr. Larson, and let, let's note it that we're a little short of time now. So uh, uh, after Dr. Larson, then we when we go to the committee members, okay. we won't have follow-up questions. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we won't have two on the list after your, your question, so we'll move on to the next, next uh, speak uh, presenters uh, on our agenda, then we can ask questions later. Sorry for those who are raising their hand, you know, so uh, go ahead, Dr. Lawson. Chairs, uh, Senator, I think we need to fund innovative research. Um, when we proposed the development of, of portable diagnostic tools back in 2018, 2019, there was a representative that says, this sounds like a complete moonshot. And we went to the moon and now we're going to Mars. <laughs> and we were, I was down in Texas um, giving a, a, a presentation much like this to the Texas legislature back in December. And they said, what can we do? And I used the example of the Minnesota legislature funding our team, funding laboratory research. We need to expand scientific research on this problem. The discovery for the, for the portable diagnostic test came from the brain of a graduate student working in the lab during the pandemic. We need to have students, we need to have faculty working on this problem. Represent Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and my question is for Dr. Osterholm. We've talked a lot about what um, prion diseases look like in animals. Can you tell us about what prion diseases like Creutzfeldt Jakob disease look like in humans? And are these prion diseases curable or treatable? Uh, first of all, the prion diseases we have, which are naturally occurring when a prion actually goes through its natural folds, that is, in a sense, uh, uh, often considered an aggressive type of Alzheimer's type picture. It, in a sense, just as we saw with animals, it's kind of a wasting disease mentally, et cetera. When we saw, and, and the one thing I would say is that this also has a very different age pattern. If you at least base it on what we saw with bovine spongiform cephalopathy in Europe, the cases were much younger, in their 30s and 40s often, which you would not expect to see that. It is 100% fatal, there's no treatment. Uh, if there's any one positive side, and I regret to call that positive, p patients like that don't tend to live very long, whereas other neurologic diseases they may live longer. But it is a horrible, horrible disease. And so I can't imagine that this is gonna be any different in humans as a prion disease than what we've seen with BSC and other Kuru and so forth, other prion diseases. Okay, last question for uh, Dr. Osterholm and Dr. Larson. I will be Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what are, I, I've heard a lot of this stuff before, so I wasn't gonna ask any questions, but you did bring up a subject. First of all, you talked about the comparisons with, uh, with COVID. And we know that there was a lot of talk that uh, the COVID disease was developed in a, in a laboratory and a lot of talk over gain of function. Now you mentioned, uh, or used the term humanized mice. And I'm wondering, are, are you developing st uh, different strains of this, of this prion for testing, uh, through your testing? And if so, what precautions are you using so that you're not actually 
maybe running the risk of putting this out there in a different strain? Mr. Chair? Yes. No, no, Senator, no. Um, our group is epidemiologists, we're not laboratorians. I'm reporting to you what's being done. Uh, when we talk about humanized mice, this is a standard of, for example, cancer research and treatment. It's a, it's a type of animal use that's wide, widespread in medicine and has been for some time. That doesn't mean that these are human mice. It's just the fact that basically what can happen to the mouse can, is more like what a human would do if it responded. Uh, any comparison to COVID, again, I just come back and point out, it's just the evolution over time of how an infectious agent can change. And we've seen that, so it's not to scare anyone, it's to say, this is what happened. We're seeing very rapid changes with the uh, strains right now, with these prions and CWD that are very concerning. Th that the fact that they are changing to the extent that what was status quo five to seven years ago can't be considered status quo today. So that's really all, all we're saying from that. And the more animals, think of this as a big fire that just gets more and more wood thrown on it. The more animals that get infected, the more chances there are genetic changes will occur in the prions that will then lead to a concern. Uh, Chairs, Senator That's Green, awesome. I can confirm that we are not developing new strains in our laboratory. Mm -hmm. We are, the diagnostic tests that we are using are using um, tissues that are provided to us by the DNR, by the Board of Dental Health, by the USDA, and the tests that we're using, can we determine, hey, this is a positive, this is a positive, the DNR called cause positive, will our test give that same result? And so that's how we're improving our diagnostic tests, is by using the tissues that are provided to us from natural populations. Well, thank you, Dr. Osterholm and Dr. Larson, for the information you gave us uh, thank you. today. Um, so uh, next will be uh, Chairman Dupree from the Fond du Lac. And we will have uh, the commissioner of DNR after Chairman Dupuy he had to, right Chairman Dupuy has to leave at four. So. Actually, Chair Dupuy is going to do a little testimony, at right? Because he has to leave at four. So if Chairman Dupuy would come forward. Apologies for the change. We're adjusting the schedule to make sure. Chairs, committee, Buju, Nagani Moose and Dijon Kaz and Nagachi Wanang and Nujabam and Gizido Dem. We do Kawashin and Gundashko to Yan Waji Chigian. Akini Nagana Mademani Duke, Akini Nagana Mani Duke, Wabanung, Zawanung, Nagawinung, Gateway to Nung. My name is Kevin Dupi. I'm the Fond du Lac Chairman. I, I was asked to come to testify on CWD and what I heard today kind of changes the perspective of what I look at at CWD. But I do need to say this. Um, what I heard today, I think it's a two, three level prong principle, but I think there's logical and low hanging fruit that can help do what needs to be done. And one of them simple things is double fencing. And everybody in the room knows that deer touch one another, ch transfer of saliva, waste, urine, why are we allowing wild deer to connect with cervid deer? That's one piece, that's low hanging fruit. I've hunted deer my entire life. I've trapped fur bears my entire life. And as an Anishinaabe person or Ojibwe person, to the ones who don't know what Anishinaabe is, it's part of a treaty principle, it's part of my way of life. And I was born into this way of life. It's a simple principle of being an Anishinaabe man. If the animals I can't eat that the creator gave, one of my arm goes away. If I can't drink the water, one of my legs leave. If I can't gather things in the woods that the creator gave me, there goes another arm. And when I can't eat the fish and the things that come from the water, there goes another leg. I cease to exist as Anishinaabe. That is our belief system. That's our way of life. And to look at a principle of here as an obligation to protect the treaty rights, not just as indigenous people, but the treaty rights are a shared resource. And I don't know if everybody in this room knows that and understands that. So why aren't the principles that need to be done to take care of something like this that can be so dangerous 
by learning and asking these questions, which I have before. And a comment was made about the sky is falling. I didn't act like Chicken Little, but it's a concern. Where does it bring us? How do we control it? What are the effects of it? If we don't know what it does to a human being, I don't know how in my position as a tribal leader, and trust me, I understand your, your jobs are, are huge, but how could we sit idly by and say it's okay? Especially if we know that something can stay in the ground longer than, um, what is that disease dogs get? Parvo. If we know it can stay in the ground longer than parvo, five to seven years, does it make sense to look at the way we're looking at it right now? We're talking about something that could progress into human beings to do the studies, to do the work that's going to be done. At that time, listening to what the gentleman said and others, the infection rate would cruise into the, it's a simple math problem. So if we look at an infection rate of that, what is that infection rate? How many deer in the state of Minnesota were taken last year during the hunting season? That's the first thing you have to ask yourself. How many deer were taken? How many deer are taken in the state of Wisconsin? And people have consumed that. I've consumed deer meat my entire life and probably a lot of other people in this room have also. But we know that we have something that sits within an animal and it has the ability to morph and change into something else. To me, it's a really, really simple math problem. How many people have eaten deer? How many deer were shot or taken just in last season? What is the consumption rate? How many deer were taken? How many deer were tested? Then are there numbers that are needed to take a look at what we look at as a population rate? Everybody in this room knows that. That's, that's simple math that needs to be looked at and looked at in, in that, that simple principle. I have children, I have grandchildren, and my job as an Anishinaabe man is to teach them the way of life. And when things in this manner happen, and this goes for anybody who sits in the room, it falls under a tradition piece. You teach your children how to hunt because you were, hunt, you were taught by your father or your grandfather or your mothers or your grandmothers. Think about what we're talking about. Think about the really concern of it and where it actually takes us. I sit here to testify on CWD how we believe it's so important to the Fond du Lac Band and all the indigenous people in, in uh, the state of Minnesota. I left the meeting where we were all meeting all 11 tribes and I asked them if they wanted anything in me, they, if they wanted me to say anything special for them. And they said no just that we all support double fencing because when you break it down, it is the most logical thing to do right now. Right now. It's the lowest hanging fruit. It gives us the ability to separate things and it gives us the ability to look at it. Um, like I said, um, I'm really surprised. I didn't know I was gonna walk into and listen to what I heard today. I have to go home. I have to tell our constituents who have a treaty right. I have to go back and tell the, le the leadership of the tribal leadership in the state of Minnesota on an extensive piece that I, I thought I was the, probably the leading tribal leader arguing the issue of CWD, but what I heard today was never ever presented to me. Was never ever presented to me. I have to ask why. I just want everybody to understand if you possibly can, it's our way of life. It's our way of life. But would somebody please do me a favor, find out how many deer were taken from the state of Minnesota last year? How many were recorded that they were tested and start walking back a few years and you're gonna get a number that I did up here I don't think you're gonna sleep tonight. I really don't think you sleep tonight. So again, we, Fond du Lac, his introduction to uh, bringing elk
to our area of our reservation in the Colquia Valley. And this is a very, very big concern with that also now. Um, but as we are now, we're gonna continue to move forward. I think one of the biggest pieces again, um, and I don't wanna say, sound like a broken record, but there's low hanging fruit that we can grab collectively to make a simple change with some security, with some security until the other work is done that needs to be done. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> next up, we will have the Department of Natural Resources. Um, Dr. Carstensen and Dr. Wheeler from the Board of Animal Health. Welcome and state your name for the record. Mr. Chairs, members, um, uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is Dr. Michelle Carstensen and I am the Wildlife Health Program Supervisor with Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Chair Hansen, Chair Her, committee members. I'm Dr. Courtney Wheeler. I'm an Assistant Director with the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. Proceed. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to talk to you today about an update on uh, how DNR is uh, working to manage chronic wasting disease in the wild. Um, first, I wanted to share some information about the history of the disease in Minnesota and a brief um, account of where we're at. Uh, so the map that I have up on this slide shows the state of Minnesota and the counties that are highlighted in green would be where there was a detection in a captive servant herd at some point in time. And then the yellow circles represent where we found the disease in a wild deer, at least one wild deer. And since um, 2002, when we began doing surveillance in the state, we've sampled about 120,000 deer, and we've had 194 total cases uh, by the end of this fall. And uh, as you can see, uh, the highest concentration of these yellow areas would be southeast Minnesota, and we'll be talking about that more today. But we have found some additional cases elsewhere in the state, including uh, one deer near Climax, Minnesota, which was recent. Um, we also had two new cases this fall, just south of Bemidji. Um, we've had two cases in the city of Grand Rapids and two in, um, uh, near Crow, in Crow Wing County. So we've had a few cases spurious outside of our main area in the southeast part of the state. We also have elk population and we've been testing elk uh, at every opportunity since 2004. Uh, we haven't had any cases of the disease found in our wild elk. We have also been testing moose at opportunities that we've had since 2004, tested over 350 moose and we have not found the disease in our moose population. This fall, we had um, quite a, a bit of work to do. <laughs> we were doing surveillance in 10 areas of the state. And in the map I have here, I've, I've delineated two different colors. And so the, the yellow areas are CWD management or control areas. And again, this corresponds to where we have found the disease in at least one wild deer. Um, and the areas that are in gray represent a surveillance zone where we're doing testing uh, as, as a precautionary measure because we have an increased risk factor that disease might be there. Either it's adjacent to where it's been found in the wild or it's in an area where we've had a captive servant farm in the past. Um, we sampled uh, 13,000 deer this past fall and we've had 26 new cases, again primarily in southeast Minnesota. Our compliance rate was quite high. We did use a mandatory testing framework to, uh, uh, to get the majority of our samples over opening weekend of firearm season, but we also supplemented that with voluntary testing opportunities I'll talk about. And we had an average of 87% compliance. And um, it, this also takes quite a bit of person power. We had over 350 folks afield on opening uh, weekend, uh, including DNR staff, as well as partnering with over 10 colleges and universities to have students work alongside us, collecting all of these samples. New this year was a pilot project um, where we used hunter mail-in kits. So this again was designed to address interest for, that hunters had to uh, have testing performed on their deer outside of the areas where we were focused on our surveillance from those other risk factors. These kits uh, were at no cost to the hunter. Um, we built 5,000 of them in our pilot year and all of them were distributed either through partnering sportsmen's groups um, or directly through uh, uh, the website where hunters could uh, request one and they were mailed to them. 
Um, so we did have all of the kits uh, requested. Uh, we had just under 600 samples um, submitted to us from this method, and we did uh, pick up one additional CWD positive uh, through the mail-in kits. So this appeared to be a, a successful program, and hunters appeared to like this opportunity. And additionally, we also expanded our partner sampling program. And so this is a terminology that most commonly uh, we're referring to taxidermists. And we've been partnering with taxidermists since we found the disease in the Fillmore County outbreak area in 2000, 2016 uh, to utilize this really awesome resource where they're already uh, obtaining heads from trophy animals, which are going to be more likely to have chronic wasting disease, adult males. Um, and compensate these taxidermists. We pay them 20 bucks a sample and they collect information and a sample for us uh, to test. To date, we've collected over 8,000 samples through this program. Um, we did expand it this last fall statewide, um, allowing any taxidermist in the state to sign up with us and participate. Um, and we also received a, a USDA APHIS grant to support that work, um, where we are also able to partner with one of our sportsmen's groups, the Minnesota Conservation Federation, to help uh, implement that program. And and that had us calling all, uh, we sent letters and called all 563 taxidermists in the state and recruited 157 and uh, collected just over 3,000 samples. So we, we feel that this was well received and we're looking to expand this into the future. Focusing a little bit more on the southeast, as I mentioned, one of the main tools, and Dr. Larson mentioned this too, was culling. Uh, so one of our main management strategies to deal with the disease where we have found it the most in this area of the state is to utilize uh, a targeted removal of deer. So in this map, you'll see the, the red colors represent historic samples or where we picked up samples in recent years since 2016, and those uh, blue ones are the most recent cases. So that's how we really utilize culling. We focus where the more recent cases are it's more like a surgical strike. You're going in and uh, working with private landowners within a mile or two of those locations and uh, asking for permission to remove deer on their land. Uh, this is with a partnership with USDA Wildlife Services. They actually are compensated through a contract with us to do the removal work. All the deer are tested. And again, our goal is to remove social groups in this area where they have, we've found a disease because they're much more likely to have chronic wasting disease and try to reduce transmission. Um, all of the deer, again, are tested and uh, all of the not detected animals are provided to the public uh, through the Share the Harvest program. Uh, so they are consumed. Uh, and we do think that that tool of culling has really helped keep our prevalence down. It has been brought up by our previous presenters, but this graph here shows you how we've been holding at, you know, around 1% in both of the areas in southeast Minnesota where we've had this persisting infection. And I think this is really important that we're able to mitigate this disease and keep it um, as suppressed as we can uh, while we hope for some additional tools available to us to manage this. When it comes to managing CWD, the culling is only one thing that we're trying to do. And it's really essential that we're partnering with our hunters and landowners to conduct any of these type of activities. Um, carcass movement restrictions is another really important management strategy where we're restricting the movement of a whole deer outside of the area it was harvested if it's in a control zone or management zone until it's either not detected, have the test results, or you can quarter the animal and safely uh, um, place those remains uh, like the brain and spinal column in one of our provided dumpsters, then you can leave with the venison that same day. That goes in with our dumpster program. We have mentioned uh, a little bit already about uh, the waste stream and how important that is. Um, in, so starting in 2017, we've been partnering with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to identify uh, how to establish a safe disposal program where carcasses in high-risk areas could be gathered and then hauled to an appropriate uh, waste stream, which is a line landfill. Uh, and so together, we have uh, received cooperation from landfills and established this program. This past year, we've had 38 sites uh, that we had dumpsters at in our CWD management zones and uh, hauled over 225 tons of deer remains to landfills with a price tag of about $250,000. We also have an importation ban that's a blanket ban, so you cannot bring in a whole cervid carcass from anywhere outside of Minnesota into our state. That's a moose from Ontario or an elk from out west, and that's again trying to mitigate these risks of uh, importing prions. We use recreational feeding and attractant bans in areas where we have disease in the wild or these heightened risks as another way to try to re reduce transmission. 
We've increased hunting opportunities in our surveillance and management op areas. And this includes increased bag limits, additional hunts like late seasons and early seasons, reduced price tags, um, anything to encourage our hunters to be uh, out there participating in these efforts. And again, partnering with our sportsmen's groups are super important. I mentioned the MCF partnership with our USDA grant, but we really try to work together to educate our hunters and gain participation. Again, this is not uh, uh, an effort that, that goes without uh, spending a lot of money. Um, and so here's a graph to show you how our spending trends have gone on since fiscal year 2003 when we really began our work. Um, there was a, a bump of spending those first three years as we did surveillance all across Minnesota looking for the disease from 2002 to 2004. We sampled almost 30,000 deer and did not find disease at that time. But then again you'll see a spike in 2010 and 11 when we found that first case in a deer in Pine Island and but did not find any additional positives. But then the increased spending has really come since the Fillmore County outbreak began in 2016. And now we're spending approximately three million in the last three years alone uh, to try to uh, implement all of the types of things I've been talking to you about for surveillance and management. So we're nearly $20 million now spent on chronic wasting disease since we've started. So in summary, CWD does remain a rare disease in Minnesota. Um, we are implementing an aggressive approach to protect our statewide deer population and maintain the hunting heritages like you heard earlier from our last speaker are so vital and important to both state and tribal communities. Uh, we want to be adapting. We have an adaptive management plan. So when new information and new science comes before us, we're able to shift gears and try to uh, uh, do the best work that we can. And again, we just cannot be successful without the participation of our hunters, cooperators, landowners, and businesses to, to implement this type of a program. Thank you. Chairs, committee members, I'm going to provide you with just a brief overview of CWD surveillance and farm survey in the state of Minnesota touch base on three different research projects which we are supporting through cooperative agreement funding. As you're probably already aware, Minnesota law requires post-mortem testing of all farms every day 12 months of age and older for chronic waste and disease. Each year in the last five fiscal years, more than 20% of farms every day have been tested for CWD. And after two decades of surveillance and farms every day, 13 herds have identified a CWD positive all herds were depopulated and all animals in the herds tested for CWD and out of more than 1,500 animals depopulated and tested, 54 tested positive for the disease. One of the primary goals in conjunction with USDA APHIS and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and many other state and federal partners is to determine how to, strap, how to stop the spread of CWD, which is why we're all speaking with you today. USDA APHIS Veterinary Services has made cooperative agreement funding available to, available to all state agencies and partners to get, engage in research and activities that control and prevent this disease. Funding can be utilized for the development or implementation of CWD surveillance, testing, management and response activities, and funds have also been made from the federal government for indemnification and removal of CWD affected farm servant herds and CWD exposed animals. So I'll tell you a little bit about Federal funding that the Board of Animal Health is utilizing um, to better get a handle on the mitigation of CWD in the state of Minnesota. So first and foremost, I want to let everyone know that um, we have used grant funding for an indemnification and removal of the CW, CWD effective herd in Monona County this last fall. Um, we are also working with the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine, who is doing a, a research project to identify Farm and environmental risk factors associated with CWD introduction to cervid herds. And the board is working on analyzing samples from Minnesota's farmed white-tailed deer to identify genetic markers considered less susceptible to CWD. In addition, we are developing an online producer portal which will allow farmers to submit inventories, movement documents, death reports, and CWD results to the board in real time. Dr. Scott Wells and his University of Minnesota team continue ongoing research to de develop resources for cervid farmers to better understand their operations risk of becoming infected with CWD and help them develop a biosecurity plan to reduce this risk. Thanks to his research, farmers can work with Dr. Wells group and their veterinarian to complete a biosecurity assessment which evaluates information about their farm and provides a framework to evaluate and prioritize risks of introduction of CWD through potential transmission pathways. 
Farmers then can use this assessment to create or approve their farm's biosecurity plan, implement changes that mitigate the risk of CWD introduction. And if anyone's interested in more information on this research project, Dr. Wells' group has a very nice website, and I'm happy to share that with you. Um, and you could actually also see the risk assessment itself on that website. It's made readily available for everyone. The Board of Animal Health is using cooperative agreement funding to work with farmers to test white-tailed deer for genetic markers that allow researchers to distinguish animals highly susceptible to CWD. So farmers collect samples and then the samples are submitted to the North American Deer Registry, which is a nonprofit organization that houses genetic information for deer breeders across North America. The North American Deer Registry is partnered with Dr. Christopher Seabury, who's an associate professor at Texas A&M University to conduct research identifying genetic markers looking for that CWD resistance. After the samples are analyzed, Minnesota farmers are provided with a report and they are provided with five genetic markers associated with the prion gene and a genomically estimated breeding value which compares them to CWD positive and negative deer across the nation. So the thought is that animals with certain genotypes and a negative breeding value, value are considered to be less susceptible to CWD. The hope with this research is that continued analysis will enable farmers to effectively categorize animals as being minimally, minimally susceptible, moderately susceptible, or highly susceptible. And farmers can utilize this information to make management decisions and eventually breed the disease um, out of their herds or at least significantly reduce its presence. And based on presentations we provided to both of these committees before, um, you're all aware that registered server farmers are required to share quite a bit of information about their animals and their herds with the Board of Animal Health. This includes submission of an accurate inventory to the board and notification of animal births, deaths, and all movements. Currently, producers submit this type of information to us through mail, email, or through their assign, assign inspectors, which, as you can imagine, is quite time-consuming um, and resource-intensive for all involved. So. The board has invested cooperative agreement funding to streamline this process by creating a real-time producer portal that the farmers can use in the field to get that information to us. This will greatly reduce the amount of time staff spent sorting and reconciling information and increase accuracy in inventories um, of all the farms surveyed in the state. Thank you, um, Dr. Willer and Dr. Uh, Cardinson. Uh, we, uh, my, my timekeeper said we running short of time, so uh, we may not give members time to ask questions. Uh, we'll see if the presentation, uh, as it go, whether we, we caught up with time. But um, be, out of re, uh, respect to one of our members who raised her hand very early on, so we want to have one question at this point. Uh, Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my question is, how does a hunter know if a deer that they have shot has CWD? If they feel, uh, feel dress it, how can they tell if this animal has wasting disease so that they know to take it to the dumpster? Dr. Carson. Chairs, members, thank you for the question. Um, so chronic waste and disease uh, isn't something that a hunter would just recognize by after they harvest it or field dress the animal. Uh, it is not something that um, they can uh, assert for themselves at the time of harvest. It has to have samples collected and sent to uh, one of our cooperating laboratories uh, where the testing happens to determine whether or not prions are present in that deer. An animal that might um, have a lot less muscle mass to the hunter and seem like it's in poor body condition would be something that's more suspect for like a clinical stage of the disease, but it might not be chronic wasting disease because deer can get all kinds of different health issues that might result in reduced condition, particularly bucks in the rutting season. So they really need to have the animal uh, sampled um, or use one of our mail-in kits or a taxidermist, but requ it requires the retropharyngeal lymph nodes that Dr. Larson referenced from, uh, from the 3D deer head to be sent in for testing to determine whether or not the disease exists. And that takes, you know, in our contracted labs, it's uh, three to four business days, but sometimes there's some delays in the height of the season. So there is a waiting period to get that information back. So the, the decision to dispose of the carcass is we recommend that they use the dumpsters that we've provi provided in these CWD areas 
uh, and just as a precaution, while they're waiting, if they're processing their deer already, they can use the dumpster. They can also have it hanging at camp until they uh, receive the test, if that's their choice. They can use a processor, and the processor waste streams are uh, most likely, in all cases, going to be dumpsters that already are uh, handled through landfills. Just quick follow-up. So if um, they take the deer to a processor, um, are they commingling with other other animals? And are these processors hanging on to the carcass or to the the um, processed deer um, while they're waiting? So is every single deer being tested? Uh, there seems like there's a big chance of of humans consuming um, animals that are infected. Mr. Chair, members. Uh, you are absolutely correct that not every deer goes to a licensed meat processor. Many hunters, including myself, process their deer at home. Um, processors uh, aren't required to keep deer separate. They can do batch processing if that's their business. We tell hunters or recommend uh, that hunters request their deer are processed individually for that reason that they could determine knowns and unknowns before they get mixed together. Unfortunately, many processors are no longer even accepting whole carcasses. It's mostly trim. That, uh, that they're accepting these days. So it's even harder for hunters to find processors now to, uh, to manage their deer. There are processors that show up kind of during deer season uh, where there might be like a sign that says, you know, deer processing 100 bucks a deer. Um, and there it might be outside of some of the windows of the normal inspected facilities. So those do pop up. Um, again, most processors use uh, line landfills as their waste stream um, and uh, process it that way. But there is a risk that deer can be processed at a processor and mixed and have a CWD positive or not tested and not ever known. Um, so we do provide some recommendations to meat processors for cleaning and disinfecting equipment. As Dr. Larson mentioned, the 40% bleach solution on stainless steel uh, can be effective. But again, that's stainless steel surfaces, not wood and other plastics that are more porous. Um, but you are correct that there's risk factors involved in that. So we have seven testifiers. We're going to go over seven minutes. Um, and it, I also want to make sure that the commissioner has an opportunity. So if we could, uh, we're going to be hearing a bill tomorrow in the House uh, on this. Uh, but if we could get the testifiers who've come in uh, who are not from, uh, not normally here, we have some citizens that want to testify. So first up, John Zanmiller, then Brad Gausman, then Steve Cook then Tim Spreck, then Dr. Scott Josephson, then Jared Muserak, and then Greg Caval. And you've got two minutes. I'll make it quick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair as well, members of the committee and staff. My name is John Zanmiller. I'm a Bluffland White Tails Association. I realize the time is tight, so let me just say one thing and expand on that. What we are doing now is insufficient. We need to do more. And historically, there has been opposition. But what I want the members of these committees joined here today to think about is that what if scenario. Not even getting into what Dr. Osterholm or Dr. Larson said. <laughs> how you vote today will determine how you respond when you bring home that positive deer or when you have venison summer sausage at a friend's house and he calls you two weeks later and says, you know, I just got my results back. Uh, my deer tested positive. Ask yourself, how did I vote? Think about the impacts that all of these things could have on our society, our Minnesota, our nearly six million people. I don't sit here today as just a deer hunter. I sit here as a resident of the state of Minnesota, understanding that there's this cottage industry, that there is this long tradition of hunting, there is this important part of our nature's cycle in Minnesota. I tell my members, we also have to think about things like car vehicle, deer vehicle collisions, crop depredation. If hunting slows or stops because of CWD, the impacts are going to be more than just a couple of weekends in November. This is an important piece of Minnesota's heritage. I urge this body
to take action in addressing this at a greater level. Thank you. Thank you. Brad Gausman. State your name and who you're with for the record. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, my name is Brad Gosman. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Conservation Federation. This afternoon, I am testifying on behalf of the Minnesota Conservation Federation and the members of the CWD Action Coalition. In addition to the organization that I lead, the CWD Action Coalition members include the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers of Minnesota, Bluffland Whitetails Association, the Minnesota Chapter of the Wildlife Society, the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, the Minnesota Division of the Isaac Walton League of America, the National Deer Association, the National Wildlife Federation, and Sportsmen for the Boundary Waters. Our coalition is very concerned about the potential of chronic wasting disease to negatively affect the health of Minnesota's wild cervids, the important cultural value of deer hunting, and the estimated $500 million economic impact that deer hunting brings to the state of Minnesota each year. I ask that you please take a moment to review the coalition document that has been submitted along with my testimony. The spread of CWD in Minnesota is real, and the impacts are already being felt by deer hunters across the state. Mandatory testing of hunter harvested deer is now required in some areas of Minnesota as the Department of Natural Resources works to identify and contain the disease when a wild deer tests positive. This legislative session, the Minnesota House and Senate may have the opportunity to consider legislation that will create a stronger regulatory environment for those involved in the captive cervid industry. Measures such as increased fencing and gate standards, a moratorium on new captive cervid operations, a more clearly defined timeline for identifying and reporting potential positive cases of CWD, and an increased oversight role by the Minnesota DNR are all steps that our coalition supports. New measures to strengthen regulatory oversight of the captive cervid industry may appear to be overly burdensome to folks working to making a living in a legal industry in the state of Minnesota. Our coalition recognizes that burden, but sees potential measures to regulate the industry as bringing Minnesota, Minnesota's cervid farms into the modern era and recognizing the very real threat posed to wild cervids in Minnesota by the spread of CWD. As this legislative body works to determine how best to engage with the realities of CWD in Minnesota, I ask that you consider the positions detailed in our coalition document detailing the potential losses to Minnesota's deer hunting culture and economy that could uh, we could suffer from the spread of this disease. Thank you very much. Thank you. Steve Cook. I have been hunting deer in Minnesota for the last 45 years. And I first dealt with CWD, or my awareness of it was heightened when in the 2000s, I started hunting at a friend's place down by Richland Center in Wisconsin. 2002, they discovered CWD, and I took awareness of the fact that it had been discovered down there. I didn't know much about it, so I began reading, and I discovered that this wasn't just something you could cook the meat longer and get rid of like you might do with a bacteria. Instead, it was this thing called a prion. And he wanted to cook it away. It took 1,100 degrees centigrade to destroy the prions in the, in the meat. Obviously, that wasn't going to be something I would be doing. I then I hunted down there because it was great hunting land, and I had a friend down there, too, who was hunting with me. But I decided to move out in about 2006 and go near Rice Lake, Wisconsin, where my wife grew up. And I've been, I hunted there for five, six, seven years, and then, and I thought CWD would take a while to work its way up naturally through the state. But by 2012, it was discovered in a nearby county, uh, <clears throat> in the adjacent county to where I was hunting. And being concerned, I, I still hunted there, figuring it would take a while for the population to build up. And at the same time, I owned land in Minnesota, and I hunted up in Minnesota. And now, I, in Itasca County, and now it's been discovered in Beltrami, and it's also been discovered in 
Grand Rapids, which is in Itasca County. So I've been trying to outrun CWD, and I haven't been very successful. Um, so I guess the, the other thing that's happened is we used to uh, have our meat processed, and as with regard to what was brought up just a few minutes ago, processors are now not handling a lot of wild deer. Uh, there's no way, if you've ever been to a deer processors in November, uh, they have freezer trucks lined up that they pack full of deer carcasses because they're handling two, four, six hundred deer in a season and processing them. There's no way they're going to uh, sanitize their tables and their equipment in between each deer. That just isn't going to happen. And the places that are really cognizant of that have quit processing deer. Koshin's up in, Grand, in Big Fork, uh, just about 15 miles from where I hunt, used to do wild deer, and they gave that up about three or four years ago. So um, the only thing they will do is if you bring them in the boned meat. Well, if you bone the deer, you've done 80% of the work, so you might as well continue to just process it. So um, I guess I encourage this legislature to take this disease serious and its impact on the wild deer population in the state. Thank you. Dr. Josephson. Chairman, committee members, uh, members, um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. I wish I had more time because uh, I'm a veterinarian uh, from southwestern Minnesota. I've been in practice for 35 years, U of M graduate, and uh, my practice is general, but we specialize in ruminant reproduction, embryo transfer, uh, IVF work in all ruminant species. And um, I also provide reproductive services to 60 plus white tailed deer farms throughout the Midwest of the United States. And I, you've heard a lot of, um, a lot of uh, scary stuff today, and, uh, and some stuff that, that makes everyone take pause. I'm bringing you some good news. I'm bringing you some positive stuff and, and some real positive scientific solutions that can be taken care of by the private sector as long as the public, or by, as long as the public sector doesn't get in the way. And that's your job, is to, is to help the private sector. Because up till this point, our response uh, to the CWD problem has been reactive. Uh, we've been playing whack-a-mole, yeah, as you might call it. And uh, when a herd pops up with uh, CWD, we eradicate, we, we get rid of the herd. When a, when a wild whitetail uh, pops up with uh, CWD, we shoot deer. Those are reactive postures, and I would propose that's not a good use of tax dollars. I'm pro proposing a proactive approach, which involves uh, genetics and resistance, as has been brought up by Courtney earlier. Um, many of you are maybe aware, maybe not aware, of the disease of scrapie in sheep. Scrapie is a, a TSC disease very similar to CWD in deer <clears throat> that has afflicted sheep for hundreds of years. In the year 2000, the USDA decided we we're going to eradicate scrapie from the United States. Scrapie was very predominant in those days. Uh, they identified two alleles that, they, that we used, and I was part of that because I've been in practice for 35 years, two alleles that, that we used to eradicate scrapie, a, a, a disease very similar to CWD, uh, from the United States in 20 years. They started in 2000. The, the effort started, really good effort, uh, uh, strong effort uh, in the 2010, 2012, and using two alleles, last year there were zero cases of scrapie in sheep in the United States. So we've eradicated using genetics. The deer uh, industry, with private and public research, has identified these resistant alleles in the, in the white-tailed deer population. There's four of them that are studied very, very closely, and also, as, as Courtney suggested, there is a 50K or 50,000 uh, genome spread that's being st studied in Texas that also indicates that, uh, that we can have some prediction of susceptibility to CWD. We need to follow the scrapie model from a governmental standpoint. Um, because it's the same, very similar disease, and they only had the technology for two alleles. We've got 50K uh, locations, 
And we also have four identified alleles that seem to be very effective in preventing uh, the development of the disease. And I referred to in my paper that I sent uh, to you uh, about, uh, there's a YouTube video that you can watch uh, uh, with the Greg Fleece uh, interview from Wisconsin. He was a, he was a herd owner that had uh, 60, percent positive in his hunting preserve in Wisconsin in, in, uh, the, in about 10, 12 years ago. He um, went aggressively after these resistant genes. He bred these as resistant genes into his herd and, and then they harvested deer out of his preserve. And this last year they harvested 51 deer, tested them all, they were all negative, both obex and lymph node. And that was because he went aggressively after the genetic resistance in the white-tailed deer. Uh, the way that we introduce uh, genetic resistance into these herds, and that's part of what we do, is we use artificial insemination. Uh, that's the way to import resistant genes without importing moving animals. You import resistant genes with the semen into these herds and, and uh, can help develop the resistance or build up the resistance in those herds. And then as, as we're seeing in this herd in Wisconsin, very likely able to, and I would predict that if we are allowed to do it, we will eradicate CWD in the pen-raised deer population. Now, I'm not, I'm not speaking about the wild deer, I'm speaking about the pen-raised deer. So we have to be very careful, you as a body, when you're making decisions, have to be extremely careful because if our goal is to eradicate CWD in the pen-raised population, for one thing, then we have to allow the, the genetic uh, uh, resistance to be propagated within that population. And we've shown that to be true in scrapie and sheep. Uh, took uh, 20 years, and I would suggest that we can do that much quicker in the white-tailed deer population. In fact, the fleece herd did it in six years. Um, so I would suggest that when you are considering, when you're considering uh, your decisions here in the next few days, weeks, about what you're going to do with the deer population. Again, I'm speaking of just the captive deer, okay? And if we're concerned about human, uh, human exposure to CWD, I would suggest that if we can eradicate CWD genetically, which appears we can, in the captive deer population, that removes that fear of, of exposure to CWD from consuming venison from the captive deer. I'm not speaking of the wild deer. We have to understand that over 70% of the wild deer population in Minnesota carry the most susceptible genetics to CWD. And we are removing those genetics from the captive deer by breeding, by selective breeding, much like we've done with every other livestock industry. So we need to follow that example. There's a population of white-tailed deer that carry a higher percentage of resistant genes in the up, upper part of Michigan. It's estimated that it will take over 100 years for those genes to propagate through the wild population. We can do it in the pen-raised deer, and we've shown uh, with this study in Wisconsin in six years. Thank you. Dr. And I'd be happy to speak to any of you individually and answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Josephson. We have two Thank other you. testifiers, uh, Jared Muserak and Greg Cavall. Maybe if you both could come down together. Thank you, chairs, committee members. Uh, my name is Jared Mazurik. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, representing some 20,000 members across the state of Minnesota. Uh, we focus on habitat conservation, uh, education, and advocacy and legislation. Um, we believe that CWD poses a significant threat to our wildlife, our ecosystems, and the rich heritage of deer hunting across the state of Minnesota. Um, as we've seen today, many of the confirmed CWD cases in the state are on or around captive serv servant farms. Uh, for this reason, we believe that we should pursue uh, legislation for double fencing, a moratorium on new servant farm registrations, uh, voluntary buyouts of currently registered service fa service farms across the state, um, the use of anti-mortem or live tests, like we heard about earlier, RT quick most likely, um, and a requirement for annual testing of all cervid, uh, captive cervids in the state, and an importation ban um, on all captive cervids originating from states or provinces that are currently, currently have CWD uh, confirmed cases. Uh, we believe captive cervid farms 
pose an unnecessary risk to Minnesota's natural resources and to our citizens. Thank you. Mr. Cavall. And if Commissioner Stroman could be ready for on deck. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Chairman Hansen, Chairman Herr, and members of the committee. Uh, thanks for allowing us to testify. I'm Greg Qualley. I'm with the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. And uh, I kind of had a prepared statement also, but uh, I'm throwing that out. And I'll tell you the reason. As I was watching this committee meeting, the first thing that got passed around was that 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 deer skull and one thing I noticed about that is just about everybody in the room took a look at that they looked at the lymph nodes and that's what we as hunters and gatherers and fishers want to do also we want to be able to have that ability to figure out how to get that gland out of there you folks have the opportunity to provide the funding to do that you have the boots on the ground in order to make that happen all the Department of Natural Resources needs is a little more money in order to make some of that happen. So you've got a group of people out there that want to protect an organic food source. It's very important to us. Those of you that hunt know that. Those of you that don't can appreciate the fact that we want unpolluted food. And we want it, and we, we want it very strenuously. We want to protect our traditions. Um, one other thing, I'll share a personal story here and then I'll get off and thanks for allowing me to kind of close this up in a little bit of an emotional fashion. So I happen to own hunting land in northwestern Minnesota and that hunting land happens to be located, actually my property almost came this close to being the bullseye of the epicenter for the bovine tuberculosis outbreak in 2005. That was a nasty deal because it was in both, it was in both uh, deer and it was armed in, in farm cattle, right? The, the whole cattle herd. And when the cattle got it, actually the cattle brought it in, a good friend of mine, Roger Skyme, his herd was the herd that was infected with it. It was put down. But when that was discovered, obviously the Department of Animal Health did their job. They quarantined the critters in, in the state of Minnesota and the Department of Natural Resources went to work on culling the herd. On a personal basis, it hurt. I did not see a deer on my property for eight years. We harvested one deer nine years later. It was a small buck. Uh, now I have to say, I have to say this to the Department of Natural Resources, one of the past managers actually promised me that he would relocate deer to the property if they didn't show up within five years. Well, they didn't show up within five years and I didn't get any deer. But, <laughs> but anyhow, I, I would just like to impress you know, on, on you folks that, that the issue here is enlisting us to help and, and, and authorizing the Department of Natural Resources more control over these herds and over the wild population and the farm survey day and give us the, the, the ability to help solve this problem and at least monitor it. You got a free cadre of people out there. I would highly encourage you to, to provide us the means to do that. Um, it's possible. We did, uh, uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers with the Department of Natural Resources did two sessions last fall. I'm sure there were more where they brought in a deer head and helped people figure out how to take those glands out of there. So I would leave you with that. Um, appreciate the time and, and, and Good luck. Thank you. Commissioner Stroman and members, we've, we've gone over time, but I want to make sure we give the <coughs> commissioner the final word here as she's been waiting patiently. So, commissioner Stroman. Thank you, Chair Hansen and Chair Her and uh, members of the committees. I'm Sarah Stroman. I'm the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And I appreciate uh, you taking up the subject today. I appreciate uh, you giving me a few minutes. Uh, apologies to Mr. Qualley. I'm not here to honor his IOU for relocated deer, but I am here <laughs> to share with the committee that CWD uh, is is of incredible incredible concern uh, to the Department of Natural Resources, and you've you've heard from uh, Dr. Carstensen from our staff. You've heard from uh, many of our partners and ind individual deer hunters, and um, I think the thing that I want to stress here is that we agree we need to be proactive 
in addressing this disease. We need to be aggressive, but we need to go beyond that response. At the department, one of our strategic priorities is to approach natural resource issues from a proactive stance. And what that means really is that we are managing through the windshield at what is coming at us, trying to get in front of it rather than watching in the rear view mirror and hoping we stay one, head, one step ahead of it. I, I chuckled when I heard the, the testifier earlier say he can't run out, see, outrun CWD. We're in that same boat. We can't outrun it. We can't just keep following it around the state. And I want to be clear, we will respond when it pops up to a new area, and we will respond aggressively. But our approach really is to get ahead of it and get in that prevention and containment mode so we don't see it continue to march across our state, threatening our dear population, threatening um, the, the enjoyment that brings to people, threatening the hunting traditions that brings to people, threatening the tribal cultural um, traditions that you heard Chairman Dupi talk about. Um, and so really what that means is we have to be adaptive in our approach. Um, as we learn more and as the spread continues, we have to change. We have to re-examine the areas of risk uh, that create opportunities and open doors for spread, and we have to modify our strategy. And you heard Dr. Carstensen talk about how we are doing that at the department, how we've changed the way we do surveillance and monitoring, how we've now made test kits available at Hunter, switching from a very localized strategy to a statewide strategy on surveillance. You've talked about how we've, she talked about how we modified our partnerships with taxidermists and many of the testifiers here. Um, I think we also very strongly believe that we need to look comprehensively at that intersection of captive cervids and our wild deer population and that really does happen at that fence and so we have over the um, past number of years as we have had concurrent authority for whitetail deer farms with the board of animal health really tried to look um, particular at that point of intersection and make sure that we are doing as chairman Dupi said taking advantage of all of those low-hanging fruit opportunities to close windows of risk um, that we see to limit spread. So last year we brought forward a number of recommendations that came about through an intense review of both the captive cervid program and our wild deer program. They were things like looking at fences, narrowing the window of time to repair a fence. When a fence falls into disrepair and it's allowing captive deer to get out of the fence or wild deer in the fence. We can do things like making sure captive deer aren't being fed too close to the fence where it's going to attract those wild deer in and you're going to have that contact. Um, there are many other recommendations. Uh, the report is on our website and so given the time I won't get into that but I'll encourage um, members to look at that if, if you're interested. Um, I would just, you know, echo again, we believe uh, that we can't keep doing the same thing and expecting to get uh, to a different place in our fight against this disease. We do believe there are still some uh, common sense areas of risk that we can close by making some changes. We are committed to continuing to be adaptive and we will look at that both on the wild management of the wild side as well as the captive side. Thank you, both chairs. Thank you, Commissioner. And, um I think we're, we're both bodies are going to have a journey here of bills coming forward. I know the administration has. One thing I would just like to get on the record, um, if the authority for regulating whitetail deer farms was transferred to the Department of Natural Resources, would you accept it? Um, Chair Hansen and Chair Herr, uh, just as the legislature made the decision to give us concurrent authority with the Board of Animal Health, um, we accepted that with the funding from the legislature, and we have been working on that. If further changes made uh, we, and funding were provided for us to do that, um, we would fulfill that authority given to us. Okay, well, thank you, Commissioner Stroman, for making your time here. You know, and even thank you to members for staying behind time uh, after uh, for 30 minutes so that we can hear all the testimony. So thank you all. And now the um, joint committee is adjourned.